38 pounds in the black corner. From St. Louis, Mr. Crow. Andre the Giant. Gonna get his legs in on the bruiser. The greatest WWE champion of all time, and in many ways, the man who made the title what it is today, Bruno Sammartino. His opponent weighing 236 pounds in the white corner from Van Nuys, California. Welcome in to another edition of the Retro Wrestling Rewind. As always, I am David Fine, alongside my tag team partner, my brother from another mother the true long island iz the hell with alex uh, the hell with alex g the hell with zach Ryder. gee thanks you dick well i mean alex last week SummerSlam 1995 this week bash at the beach 1996 in your honest opinion, have we gone up down or are we kind of going sideways in our choices of pay-per-views to talk about uh, this being bash the beach 1996 it is the most important pay-per-view in the history of wcw now it might be the most important pay-per-view in ww wcw's history including the uh, jim crockett stuff so this, this is a very important pay-per-view you, you really think that yeah 100 percent Number two, I've been to the Ocean Center in Daytona Beach, and they have a picture of Hulk Hogan in the hallway. Like with all the great acts that came through there. Yeah, Hulk Hogan's on that. That that is rather weird, but I mean, it of course took place July the seventh, nineteen ninety six, like you said, Daytona Beach, the Ocean Center, eight thousand three hundred are in attendance for this fine pay per view. Before we get started and kind of tear this thing down, what overall, what would you, I mean, you know, before we start talking about it and start digging, what would you give it between a one and a six, nine, ten? What would you give it? You know, if, you know, like you say, on paper, how does the pay per view look? It's a, it's a 69, is what I would consider it. This is typical WCW, 100%. There is nothing on the planet that's more WCW than this show. I, I, I don't know what, what the hell does that mean? It, it's no. Who was booking this shit? I mean, literally, who was booking this shit? Kevin Sullivan? The Games Master? The Evil Man? The man who. Taskmaster! The ta- Whatever. I love Kevin Sullivan, but I love him in Florida. I mean, he, he did great shit in Florida, but. I will defend the Dungeon of Doom. You, you will defend the Dungeon of Doom? I am a Dungeon of Doom apologist. Can, can you. Tell me, you know, before we start talking about this pay-per-view, when you say you're an apologist, like you say you're a you're a Doom apologist, you're a Mark Miro apologist, you're Lex a... Lex Luger, you can do it there. You're a Vin, we're you're, talking about Kevin Nash, a Kevin Nash apologist. Yeah. You're a Vince Russo apologist who... No, that's going too far. That's a, that's a step too far. Well, what do you mean by that? Say, it's real simple. A lot of people fucking rag on these motherfuckers. And I'm like, hey, guys, they weren't so bad. Yeah, I mean, they... I mean... Yeah, let's just kind of, you know, since I'm sure, you know, back in the day. I, I, I need you to shut the fuck up. Here's the deal with this show. I'll tell you. Did you this tell is, me to shut the fuck up? I did. I did. And you deserve it. This is typical WCW. But first, we have to talk about Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. Now, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall make their re-debut uh, a, a couple of weeks earlier. This is their first actual match in ring back in WCW. So here's the thing about Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. Now, Kevin Nash being one of probably, to be completely honest, maybe the biggest star, can we say that, that came out of the power plant? Yeah, well, he's WCW through and through, trained in the whole nine. Now, Scott Hall's been around for a long time, since 1984. He was supposed to be on Starcade 84. He wasn't on Starcade 84, but that goes without saying. Former AWA tag team champion with his good friend, Kurt Hennig. You know, spent a lot of time throughout the territories in the 80s, but it wasn't until like 1991-92 that it started to come together for Scott Hall. Now, both of these gentlemen 
were in WCW prior to this. Now, there's some people that may know this, and some people that may not know this. Now, Kevin Nash had been one half of the Master Blasters. That was lame. He was one half of, well, not even one half. Well, he was kind of one half. One half of Oz. Because he was with Kevin Sullivan as the, uh, as the, uh, you know, the wizard. It was weird. So he was Oz. He was a Master Blaster. Then he was Vinny Vegas. Vinny Vegas was pretty good. But again, he was a lower mid-card heel. Hanging out with DDP and Scotty Flamingo. Ridiculous, right? Scott Hall eventually gets it all together, becomes the diamond stud who ends up to being a lackey for DDP. Again, lower mid-card heel. Now, in terms of Kevin Nash, you see Kevin Nash, legitimately almost seven feet. Good look, pretty good charisma. He's working the ring. Yeah, he can have good matches with Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. But Kevin Nash, much like Eligante, the Big Show, Ryback, Ted Arcidi, Bill Kazmaier, so on and so forth. Sid Vicious. He is main event or bust. Which means, like, if you look at Kevin Nash, there's no way he should be on second match wrestling Brad Armstrong. Just not going to happen. He's either you know, be a main eventer or he's going to be out of your company. And, you know, WCW misused him. So, there you go. Lower mid-card babe, uh, heel in WCW. Ridiculous. Eventually, he goes off the WWF and becomes the World Heavyweight Champion. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You have Scott Hall. Fantastic worker. Once he changed his look from that big Scott Hall, that Magnum Scott Hall, or that Gator Scott Hall, he got the stubble. He has the black hair. Looking good. Has a hell of a finish here. And the uh, Razor of that. Again, in WCW, lower mid-card heel. Had a couple of matches with Tom Zack. Good as a WWF. And right off the bat, guess what? He's feuding with Randy Savage. Yeah, Fucking man. Fucking phenomenal, right? Then he's having five-star matches. Could, you, could anyone in 1986 predict that Scott Hall was having five-star matches? Yeah, I, would, I did. No. no, shut the fuck up. You did not predict that. By the time he gets to WWF, he's having five-star matches with Shawn Michaels. So they had their little run in WWF, and now they're back in WCW as huge stars where, in fact, if WCW had booked them properly from begin with, they could have had some homegrown talent here at the top of their card instead of investing a lot of money in former WWF talent. But they didn't, and now they're back. So we're going to start there. Yeah, I mean, if you look at this card, there are a lot of a lot of show, a lot of uh, matches on this card that were on main event. So you had to watch main event to see the great Steiner brothers taking on Harlem Heat. That was a really good match, though. Bobby that was five minutes goes DQ, but very fun match. Love Sister Sherry, by the way. Yeah, She's all the way live. Yeah, I mean, and then Colonel Robert Park, you've heard rumors yeah. uh, about his. Uh, well, you know, anyway. His penis being ginormous. Uh, no, I was. I've no. never, I've never seen Robert Parker's penis. Um, I, I've heard rumors on the indie circuit that, well, you know, it's it's rather large. Rumors, but, uh, my ass. You 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 you've watched him in the shower. I don't know what your problem is. Stop being a peeping tom. Hey, I mean, he he said I would get a head in the business if I watched him in the shower. I mean, he said he's like, you're gonna get some head in the business. That's what he said. And, and hey, and look at me now. I'm on a podcast with the great Alex G. God, my life is just complete. Hang uh, out with Terry Garvin and Pat Patterson. You're you're one of the few graduates of the Terry Garvin School of House uh, School of Self Defense, by the way. You know they specialize in go behinds. Uh, well, the old the old. I love the old reach around, but they, I mean, it was funny, of course. They did not have two great wrestlers on this pay-per-view. They didn't have Lord Steven Regal and Eddie Guerrero. They had That's a hell of a match, too. I mean, it's very short, though. If you, ever, you know, Go back and watch your, your main events, especially you know, if you're going to watch these WCW pay-per-views. And they, have, they do a lot of pre-shows on the main event, which is the Sunday uh, afternoon show, I guess you would call it. You know, do yourself a favor and watch some of these matches. They're really good. You also have the Rock and Roll Express versus... Fire and Ice, which is Ice Train, my favorite wrestler, and Scott Norton, which is, you know, it's a lot of fun. Again, a good way to warm up the crowd. Again, this this card in total, including the main event matches, 14 matches long. It's like a 
WWF Haven from 1989. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's kind of like as, the, as many matches as they have in, on the WWE. It, it, it's actually about as many matches as they had for the Starcade show that was just here in, uh, in the did Atlanta. Did you watch that, Trash? I, I did not. I was actually going to go to the pay-per-view, but I ended up not being able to go. But yeah, did you watch any of the, did you watch the two matches or three matches or whatever the hell, the no, two matches I, in I, the, the... Last year's was trash, so... Again, I'm not going to. Sub, I'm, I'm not going to hate watch wrestling. It's not going to. I don't. Yeah. Do, I mean, deals. but but the good thing is the the first match that you actually saw on this pay per view is Rey Mysterio taking on Psychosis. I mean, two great wrestlers. I mean, hell, Rey Mysterio Jr. still going today. I mean, going. it's 2019. You know, I mean, what were your thoughts on this? You know, match. You know, it's it's not the first match that the people in the arena sees, but it's the first match that you see on the pay per view. Again, when I talk about prototypical WCW, this is the ridiculousness of, of WCW in total. We have a fantastic international Lucha Libre match to start off the show here, followed by Earthquake taking on Big Boss Man. That's the ridiculousness of WCW. You have these pseudo dream matches. You have these guys from from you know all around the world. It would be Japan. It would be Mexico in, in terms of this case, and, and you, it kind of had this weird kind of concoction here and that's what made wcw great at the time now ray mysterio versus psychosis again this is a match that we've seen on ecw and these guys went around everywhere with this match again a phenomenal match ray mysterio this is before he gets extra big if you know what i mean this is before all the injuries psychosis is out there doing his thing again this is a phenomenal match it goes 15 minutes of just wall-to-wall action Fucking fantastic! Again, this is this is why I love WCW. This match in particular. I mean, it was a great match to open the card, but I mean, it's funny you're talking about it's uh, you know the next match we had John Tenta, Big Bubba Rogers. It wasn't just a regular match; it was a Carson City Silver Dollar match. You ever been to Carson City? No. Have you? No. Where the hell is Carson Car- City? Is that I mean, near Las Vegas? Like this probably, not even near this fucking. Like Daytona Beach. Like, no, why can't this be like Daytona Beach silver dollar match? Like anyone's gonna know the fucking difference. I, I don't know. I mean, it, I mean, like you said, Kevin Sullivan was booking this shit. So I mean, I don't know. He wanted. Yeah, no, it's funny. Like if you look at Earthquake versus Bossman in 1990, like this would have been a fucking dope match. Now just picture Earthquake versus Bossman in WWF 1990. It would have been really good. Again, John Tenta, criminally underrated. Criminally underrated. He could have made a really good babyface WWF champion. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. He was he was over in the national uh, national disasters, and Boss Man, you know, Big Boss Man didn't give a shit. He's taking fucking superplexes off the top of cages from Hulk Hogan. It's fucking amazing. The problem with this match is that it's 1996 and not 1990, and John Tenta is at the end of his run here. You know, Big Bubba is not long for this world. He had, He's not really out there having classic match, although he would return to form once he went back to WWF. But again, this is the whole thing where, you know, John Tenta was thrown out of the Dungeon of Doom. You know, he was, after he first started out being Avalanche, then he was Shark, and then he's just a man, John Tenta. He's not a fish. He's a man. And then Big Bubba, like, shaved his mustache and shit. And this is a, a, big, a pretty big feud in terms of the uh, Dungeon of Doom here. But again, as we can see, everything is about to change. Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, I, I was a big Bubba Rogers fan back, and I wasn't even a real big Bossman fan because, I mean, when I, Bossman, like when Bossman lost the weight, he got mm-hmm. really slim, like around mm-hmm. 90, 91. He's having phenomenal matches. Like that WrestleMania 7 match was perfect, it's fucking phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, he, he I, mean, I thought it was good as Big Bubba Rogers back in the NWA, but like you said, he, he had lost a lot of weight in, you know, in the early 90s, so he was lighter on his feet. I mean, and that, that match with Perfect was, was what can I can say, was actually a really good match. I, you know, I can't wait to talk about that. You know, it's just, I mean. We did on our very first show, you motherfucker. We're going to talk about it again, maybe. I don't know. You never know. I, I, I like to have amnesia, but. <laughs> the next match like we that had, anal, what you said? No, I did not say that. The next match, of course, right. is another freaking gimmick match, a tape fist match. They were heavy on the gimmicks here, because they had a gimmick inside of a gimmick yeah. inside of a gimmick, which is I really mean, weird. Our friend Hacksaw Jim Duggan uh taking on Diamond Dallas Page. 
D D P. Yeah, this weird angle when Jim Duggan went back to his roots, like in Ireland, and they figured out like his grandmommy was like a tape fish fucking champion and shit. So he would do this thing where he would tape up his fist and punch people in the face. Now this was for I believe this is for the uh, Lord of the Ring ring. Yeah, which is odd because I think AEW is being back the ring concept, which is very much a Dusty Rhodes type concept. Yeah, and, and I mean, and speaking of you know, kind of Dusty Rhodes his concepts. I mean, as you know, Cody is trying to uh, he's trademarked, copyrighted a lot of the the Dusty ideas. You know, uh, they're bringing Bash of the Beach back for one of their uh, one of their shows. I mean. Do you think that is something that the fans will get into that are, are you know, the older fans or the newer fans of uh, AEW to get kind of uh, the old old school feel? I mean, if he can get any of the stuff. I mean, if he could ever get Starcade, which he'll, I don't think he'll ever be able to get. I mean, do you think it's something that the fans would I think, I get think behind? A, I think there's an appeal there, especially for the more gimmicky um, type names. Like Bash of Beach is a really good name. And WCW always did well with it. They always had it like in the beach setting. You know, it was, it was really cool the way that they done it uh, in the past. And you can make an argument that Bash the Beach, top four WCW pay-per-view, maybe top five. Can you get Hogan's debut on Bash the Beach? You have, you know, the big angle at the end of this show at Bash the Beach. You have a lot of things going on at this pay-per-view. So, but I was like the, the concept. Now, the one they need to get, in all honesty, is Halloween Havoc. Because everyone loved Halloween Havoc. Yeah, spin the wheel, make the deal. Spin the wheel, make the deal. I mean, and Can you talk w- about how DDP was a jobber and kind of really worked his way up to literally in the main event? Like, he was a shitty wrestler for a very long time. And he was a he shitty manager. He was a and shitty then, manager. Like, he was awful forever. And then all of a sudden, like, I guess, like, the light bulb went on, the switch went on, and, like, you know, you start getting behind him, and he's, like, the, the people's champion, and... And he has the diamond cutter, which really helps. And by the end of WCW, he's like he's like top guy. It's like an amazing transformation if you start from like 1991 Dallas Page and you look at like 2000 Dallas Page. Like it took him a long time to get there, but I mean, and just think, I mean, where he started, I mean, he became champion. I mean, it, yeah. who, who? I mean, who would have thought that? I mean, I. I I did not think that, and of course... It's a hell of a story. Unfortunately, WCW was not able to tell that, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it's WCW, especially the later WCW. You know, they couldn't tell that, hey, listen, this guy was literally on, on first matches, like, being awful, you know? And then all of a sudden, like, all of a sudden, he's having these matches with, like, Johnny B. Bad that are really fucking good, like, really out of nowhere. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is. I mean, I, I hark back to, uh, I think it was... When he first started, it was maybe he was been there for a minute. I was actually driving downtown, uh, downtown Atlanta, and they were taping an angle with him uh, when he did the whole homeless kind of losing all his money hobo. gimmick, and he was, you know, he was a uh, begging for money. It was, I mean, he has come a long way. I mean, it's he's still, he, I mean, he's still not, I mean, not really wrestling, but he's still involved in AEW. You see him all the time. He was on the last, uh, on the last TV show, the last taping last week, and. He, he's definitely still got his hand in that uh, wrestling, that wrestling water. But yeah, I mean, just I mean, he is. It's, he, it's those guys that we get behind. It's that it's those guys that we can follow from start to finish. That we can really like. I'll give you another example, like Brett the Hitman Hart. You know, we saw him who? when he debuted in WWF as you know just single Brett Hart, and then the incarnation of the Hart Foundation, and then IC Champion, and then world champion, even like with Shawn Michaels, we saw the progression. And, and unfortunately nowadays with the way modern booking is kind of gone, it's like the time is very short in terms of like, hey, listen, this guy debuts and he's a champion like in eight months, like Sheamus or some shit like that. You know what I mean? And you don't really get behind those guys and you're not invested into these guys. And then eventually they win the championship so early. And now, guess what? Now they're stuck in the mid card for fucking ever. So we don't see a progression. What I got like DDP, we literally, we, we took that journey with him. From the opening match to the main event, and you know it's fucking fantastic. Yeah, man, and um, I mean he was in a tape fist match with uh, Mr. Tough Guy Hacksaw Jim Duggan. I mean, it's... Duggan at the time was a pretty substantial star. I mean, yeah, his run is coming to a close here, and he's already been in WCW for like a year and a half, almost two years. But I think people forget that Duggan was like number two babyface to Hogan in WWF. Like, 
he was up there on the card. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, he's one of those guys, and you know, folks, if you you know, go over on our Twitter pages, the RW Rewind. Um, that's of course our website as well, uh, the rwrewind.com. But go on Twitter. I'm gonna have a poll up there uh, today. It's 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 up there right now. Who would you want us, Alex G, and anybody else that comes on the program, to go in depth? You know, like a hacksaw Jim Duggan. He he was, I you know, knew good. He, he maybe not hacksaw Jim Duggan, but you know, like a DDP, kind of like chronological and talk about his career. Or uh, I was watching a, a a YouTube video of a young Rowdy Roddy Piper whenever he first got into the business. I mean, or Ric Flair or anybody, whoever you would want us to do kind of a special, you know, kind of like an in-depth look at their career, just hit us up on Twitter at the RW Rewind. And speaking of Twitter, I mean, I have been watching, and I, I must admit my wife has kind of gotten addicted to it, and I've kind of had to tell her to tone it down, watching it up on that 100-inch 100, 100 TV in our living room. Your YouTube channel, I mean, it is awesome. And if anybody wants to... You know, to to get on that on that uh, that train that bandwagon of your um, of your retro uh, video games channel, how can they get there and how can they follow you on Twitter? What you want to do? You want to go to Retro Wrestling uh, Games Presents on YouTube. You know, make sure you subscribe. You know, we have about three hundred and fifty seven videos. There's gonna be something on there that you're gonna like, one hundred percent guarantee. You know, make sure you you hit the you know, Thumbs up. Make sure that you leave a comment, even if it's a negative comment. I like those. Those are, those are fun. I can tell you how stupid you are. It's fucking awesome. But yeah, check out the videos. They're really good. We did, uh, The latest NWA 1984 project just dropped, like, I guess, like a week ago. So, you know, check that out. You know, I'll buzz about that. So, really good stuff. I mean, is there any... I mean, I guess the y'all, y'all talked on the whole Cornette situation. So, it's like... We talked we talk Cornette. We talked CM Punk. We talked some AAA. It was good stuff. Yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, the whole the whole Jim Cornette thing is just kind of, it's kind of dying down. But it, of course, Dave Marquez, uh, you know, he's uh, you know, big Mister NWA guy. He kind of not defended Jim Cornette, but he just you know, read up uh, on his uh, on his Facebook page. He kind of uh, not. He just kind of goes into explains Jim Cornette. So just you know, look him up on uh, on Facebook, and you know, it's kind of dying down. I mean, they've taped all the episodes, and he's yeah, not I mean, gonna. It is, it... Unfortunately for the NWA, they did a recap show right after this. Yeah, it was so again. The views went way down. Again, there's a lot of people who they were in a, a really bad spot because the, essentially what happened is that you went out of your way to alienate your current fan base to appease a fan base that doesn't even watch your show. So now no one's gonna watch your show. Yeah, and that's sad to me because those. The guys on there work so hard. They have some really good stuff on there. They do a little bit too much of the, of the parody type stuff, and I wish they wouldn't do that. You know, we want if you want to see old school wrestling parody, you can watch what they did on Impact not too long ago, which is weird and and, and stupid. They shouldn't do that no more. Um, you want to be inspired by by history. You don't want to parody history. Yeah, I'm at, I'm at, yeah. That's, I'm the, that's the danger of what they're doing is that. It can turn into parody real easy. Yeah, I mean, I think the, and, and yeah, you do not want to go down that down that rabbit hole that uh, impact has gone down i mean i think the only thing good about impact right now is tessa blanchard that's I would that agree. and brian cage yeah i mean he, he's a freak of fucking nature i mean i don't know why he's not wwe champion right now you know why he's not wwe champion because he doesn't work for wwe they don't want him i, I, I don't think him. i would sign him to aew i would sign him to my backyard fed i would sign him if i had a million dollars just give it to him uh, I'm sure your wife would really like that. If you had a million dollars, just give it to some random guy who. Just so I could oil him up, yeah, one hundred percent, dude. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't judge. I don't judge, but uh, you know, it's speaking of things we're gonna judge. Next match, the Nasty Boys, Brian Knobs, Jerry Sags, taking on Public Enemy, Rocco Rock, and Johnny Grunge in a double dog collar match once again. Another gimmick match. Was Public Enemy? I think Public Enemy was the first real ECW act, quote unquote, or ECW creation to to burst on the uh, the mainstream scene here. And unfortunately for for Public Enemy, I really love Public Enemy and ECW. I thought they were fucking phenomenal. I think what happened once they went to WCW and and, and more so the WWF is that they got exposed. They got exposed as a uh, Paul Heyman creation more than all these guys are fantastic workers. 
Rock of Rock was okay. Johnny Grunge, not so much, unfortunately. Like, they would have good matches with the Nasty Boys. Like, I would have liked to see this match in ECW, not WCW. Like, this one. I'm surprised the Nasties never went over there. Like, that's like, they would have they been super over it in ECW if they would have went. But this is a fun match, and it's violence, right? violence by design, only by nature, whatever you want to call it. You know, it's a fun match. Again, the Nasties, they sh- like, their hardcore wrestling is so fucking, like, sloppy and, and dangerous to a certain degree that it makes it very entertaining. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, uh, I mean. Like, who doesn't like the Nasty Boys, really? Yeah, I'm, I'm a big Nasty fan. I mean, I, I love the Nasty Boys. I mean, they were great. Like their fans. best match may have been that match with the Steiners at the Halloween Havoc. Like, yeah. that might have been their best, like, in ring performance, but they, you know, they had a good one in WWF for a while. You know, they had a good one here in WCW. Like, I know Brian Knobs is like, oh, like he's one of, uh, he's a Hogan stooge or whatever, and Jerry Sags can be very annoying uh, to people, but they're fucking nasty boys. Of course they are. <laughs> the fuck do you expect? Yeah, I mean, it's the, I mean, it's, you know, they were, I mean, they, they were great. I mean, they were, you know, former tag team champions in multiple you know, promotions. I mean, it was... Like, I would put them in the Hall of Fame. I don't think, like, they're not in any Hall of Fames. No. And I think the Nazi boys deserve, at the very least, a WWE Hall of Fame. Just to see them on, on stage with live mics would be ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, it's, especially in 2019. I mean, you know, getting yeah. them getting them on a, on a live mic. But, you know... Uh, the Nazi boys for WWE Hall of Fame. Hashtag. Hey, we're going we're gonna to get that started, and it's going to... Yeah, I bet you... 2020, 2021, people are going to listen to this and be like, hey, let's get the Nasty Boys in the WWE Hall of Fame. Yeah, Coke will be wearing that. Oh, come on, guys. So no. The, the next they match. They do. They do that. Coke will be wearing is currently in the WWE Hall of Fame. Why not the Nasty Boys? So isn't Hacksaw Jim Dugan in there? Jim Dugan's in there. I think he's more deserving because he was a, you know, a top of the card act for a while. Yeah. You know, speaking of uh, top of the act, person who is currently working for AEW, D Malenko. I'm talk about Disco Inferno. Taking on Disco Inferno. Don't let Disco Inferno book anything. Ever. You, you, wait. Okay, wait, wait. Time out. Are you not a Disco Inferno fan? No, he's a fucking goof. Why? I mean, I've met Disco in, per- in person. So, Still uh, a goof. No, I, I mean, I've worked with him on many a, many a independent show you here goof? in Georgia. Yeah, I mean, he's a he's a jack off. I mean, he he. I mean, well, I don't know what he does on his but free time. If but you if you if if you go in the dictionary, and you look at the world the word tool, it's fucking Glenn Gilberti. Like, there should be a picture of him right next to it. He's a tool. I mean, that's the way it is, and th- that's the way he is. And you got you, and you, you kind of like, oh, okay, it's just disco being disco. You know what I mean? Oh, Disco's getting heat on Twitter because he, he slags on women's wrestling. Or Disco gets heat on Twitter because his ideas include building the evil architect or the you know the invisible man <laughs> or, or alien invasions like that kind of shit, right? That's that's what he likes, and that's what you know. That's why you know you never you never have him in the booking group at all ever. He's keep him away. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's one of those things. It's I mean he was he's a good gimmick wrestler. I mean he he I liked him like. You know when his, you know, Disco was his best? When he was part of the Filthy Animals. Yeah. With Conan, and they changed the name from, from, from Disco Inferno to Disco, like Cisco, the uh, the singer. I thought that was fun. But that's about it. That's the only one I really liked of his. Yeah, I mean... Uh, and when he tagged him, when he tagged him with Alex Wright. D- das Wunderkind. Yeah, I mean, well, your favorite wrestler. Uh, he, I mean, he, he will. I mean, he should be in the Hall of Fame. Hall of Pain. Hall, Hall of Fame. He should also be in the Hall of Pain, but that's that's beside the point. There's not much more to say about this match. I mean, it was. I mean, it's for the WCW Cruiserweight title. You know, you have uh, Dean Blanco in his prime here carrying Disco to a, to a decent match. You know, I'd much rather see Dean Malenko versus Ultimo Dragon or something. I wish that was on this show. I'd rather see Dean Malenko versus anybody besides Disco Inferno. Where's Chris Jericho? I don't is know. Lo- yeah, I don't know. He's not on this card. I don't know where La Champion is, but uh, I don't know if he's in. He might be not in yet. Yeah, I don't know. But I mean, it, it's it's kind of funny, you know. Um, we have Dean Malenko, like super like smart mark guys love Dean Malenko, big guy in the sheets, whole nine. And then you have Disco Inferno, right? Which is like a this is a freak show match, right? It's like 
we would have, you know, it's it's so it's so WCW. We have like this great worker who's he's capable of, of having five star matches any night of the week, and he's in the ring here with with this going for him. Like this is so WCW. Yeah, no, I mean it, like, it's ridiculous in a good way. When I say ridiculous, it's like it makes it makes you smile because it's so ridiculous. I mean, speaking of ridiculous wrestlers, Joe Gomez. No, 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 no. Joe Gomez is. I mean, he's Joe Gomez, but Steve sure. Mongo fucking McMichael with Queen with Queen Deborah, really? Steve McMichael, really? I mean, he was a terrible. He was, was a ter- terrible. Player. He was a terrible announcer. I mean, I, I guess he was an okay football player. I don't know. He was a, he's a fucking Hall of Fame fucking football player. I mean, hey, I mean, you know, anybody? I mean, I mean, you get it, you get enough votes, I guess you can be in the Hall of Fame. So, but that's whatever. I mean, but he. he even Michael was cool because you were able to bring in uh, what's his name uh, the guy from the Packers and then he went to Carolina I forget his name I he don't know I, I'm not a football I'm not a foosball man so I don't know yeah because you're, you're ridiculous I mean yes I, I'm can, ridiculous can we just say that Deborah has some nice titties and move on yes she has some um, nice puppies as uh as I mean, a, I would get from Steve Austin because he was beating her too much, but whatever. Hey, you know, I mean, allegedly, I'm, I'm allegedly she deserved it, but uh, I'm, I don't know. Do you think? Do you think she had pepperoni nipples? <laughs> I'm sure she did. I mean, like I, we never found out because she never, and she always looked like she was forty, like like she always looked like a milf. Like she looked like a milf in 1996. I don't know if it was. From the like, she looked older than what she like. She didn't look bad, but she looked older than what she was. Yeah, I mean, it, it's. I mean, she was. She was in her forties in nineteen ninety six. Uh, like they say, they all saying she was road hard, put away wet. So just, Ooh, just good one. I mean, yeah, that's what my wife says that all the time about people. But that's beside the point. But yeah, yeah pepperoni nipples. <laughs> Hashtag pepperoni nipples. Speaking of, really two, really good looking women woman miss elizabeth they were with the nature boy rick flair as he take as he took on conan he was the current u.s champion this match was for the title i mean rick flair versus woman. conan if you think about it like on paper sounds fucking amazing what the fuck i mean okay on paper does everything look good on paper to you well yeah i can i can i can write down the greatest wrestling card of all time on paper and have it be shit in execution you know what i mean that's yeah. what i mean by that like yeah. You know, if this was 1993 and Conan's like one of the top stars in Mexico, the top star, the Mexican Hulk Hogan, and this would have been in L.A., they would have sold out 50,000 seat arena easily for Ric Flair versus Conan. Unfortunately, this is 1996. Unfortunately, Ric Flair doesn't have really had great matches with luchadors. And unfortunately, Conan has not changed his style yet from a lucha libre style to an American, I guess a Western American style yet. So we have this match. And then we have Ric Flair wins the United States Heavyweight Championship, which he hasn't held since fucking the Mid Atlantic days, which is again a ridiculous all on its own. I mean, it, I mean, it's Ric Flair. I mean, of course he can hold, like, hold any title, make it next. Jesus fucking Christ! Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, he's it gonna... seems weird. I mean, he does drop it to Eddie Guerrero, which is again is weird, but again, typical WCW type stuff. Yeah, I mean, Ric Flair versus Conan, nineteen ninety six at Bash of the Beach. You know, second from the top. Yeah, I mean, he, I mean, it's so just... that was fucking jacked. Like he would get smaller uh, when he became a cholo, and then in the Dungeon of Doom and such. Um, but Conan was pretty fucking big. Like he was a big fucking dude. Yeah, I mean, he was. I mean, it... he was always a little sloppy though with you know with his work. But again, most luchadors, except for Rey Mysterio, tend to be a little sloppy. If you watch Triple A, I just recently watched a Triple A pay per view and. You know, they get a lot of air. Right? There's a lot of misses on that on that show, and it gets a little sloppy. You know, you know, Conan becomes you know, a better, I guess, American type wrestler uh, later on. Uh, again, when he becomes a becomes a gangster and such. But you know, at this point, he's still transitioning from that, and he's still you know very much working a lucha libre style, and that really doesn't really jive much, you know, really well with Flair and his, you know, you know late 70s early 80s wrestling style that he had so again it's just um, you know you would think this would be a fucking fantastic match on paper but again in an execution maybe maybe it shouldn't have gotten 16 minutes 
No way. I mean, it definitely should not have. Uh... Who's Floyd with the facelift? Is it? Is this year, right? No, is that maybe it's the following year when he gets his head shredded with the fucking cage? But he gets like plastic surgery like within the next year or so. Yeah, I mean, it was his yeah, death. His... Injury, yeah, too. I mean, I, I gotta, I gotta get a, I got a question for you. I'm kind of gonna go on, you know, a little differently. We're not, we're gonna be getting away from the pay per view right now. Gonna be kind of talking about the paper, the um, the shows that we're gonna be covering for the rest of the year. Of course, next week we have Royal Rumble 1994. Week after that, Survivor Series '88, Starcade '90, WrestleMania One, Survivor Series '89, and Spring Stampede '1994. The 94 Stampede show is awesome. That will, Austin versus Great Mood on. That, that will be actually be our first show of the uh, first or second show of the new year. I mean, what were your thoughts on the on the shows that we're going to be covering for uh, the next couple of weeks before we uh, end uh, 2019 and go into 2020? I like I like I like the concept of, of, of Rumble 94 because they, they, they really did something different with the finish of the Royal Rumble that year. Again, WrestleMania 1, you know, again, what can what can we say about WrestleMania 1 that hasn't already been said a thousand times? But um, trust me, I got some new shit, especially when it comes to uh, Barry Windham and Mike Rotunda. Um, again, when we look at these shows, you know, they're they're fun encapsulations of the time. Again, you always should watch the TVs, you know, before I'm a little bit after to get a, get a really in-depth look at it. But I think, you know, when you see like, hey, it's fucking, it's Steamboat versus Flair in 1994, and they're having five-star matches again. And this is the last pay per view before Hogan's debut, and how everything changes. And and I'm a big fan personally of of pre Hogan post Bischoff WCW. Like they were doing some really cool stuff. Then Hogan comes in, he brings all you know his buddies and what have you. It changes for a while, and they have some rough patches up until <laughs> this particular show. I mean, boy, folks, if that's not a tease to you know stay tuned for our. Uh... The rest of the shows, the, the that's all I did was put the tip in. Oh man, <laughs> oh man. Moving on to our next match, we had the Giant and the Tax Mask Task Master taking on Double A Arn Anderson and Chris Benoit and Task Master in general, though. Yeah, I mean, and and speaking of Double A Arn Anderson, have you? Um, you probably haven't. Have you heard his new podcast called Arn? I have not listened to Arn Anderson's podcast because I'm so behind on podcasts because. I listen to them. I try to listen. There's like five or six that I really enjoy. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not looking for podcasts that are entertaining. And I like Conrad Thompson's podcast. They're, 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 you know, they're really funny and they're heavy on the shtick, right? Uh, I don't necessarily learn anything new from those, though. Yeah. You know, I'm always trying to expand my wrestling knowledge here. And so I just choose to go to a different direction in terms of my podcasts where, you know, in some cases, they may be a little bit more boring, or you know, maybe a little bit less dramatic, or maybe not have the, the 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 well-known wrestlers on the shows. But I'm learning more about what happened during a period of time. Yeah, cool. yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, Arn's. I mean, he's definitely um his. Yeah, def- the only Anderson fucking podcast to be all for it. Yeah, I don't think he's going to be doing that. He's. I don't think he's his health is uh, doing. He's not very, long for this world. No, he's not long for this world, literally and figuratively. But the Arn podcast, I mean, it's kind of hard to listen to. I mean, great stories, but his he's got that kind of raspy voice now, yeah. you know, and it's just kind of hard to listen yeah, to. Not for nothing, guys. Why is he not the authority figure for AEW? Like, why can't he be like the commissioner or vice president or something? Like, let him do something on TV because he still could fucking talk really really good he just had that thing with, with tosh point oh whatever 2.0 i don't know who that fucking motherfucker is <laughs> i fuck that guy but you know arn is relevant let arn make these decisions you know let him be the point person you know you can say tony khan had put arn anderson in charge of aew and call that a day yeah you don't have stupid shit like the young bucks and cody rhodes have to do these press conferences out of character yeah, I mean, it, it, it is just kind of weird. But, you know, I was not a fan of the Giant. You didn't like Paul White? No, I mean, I, I'm, not, I mean I'm not even a Big Show fan. I mean, I just... I'm not a Big Show fan either. I thought the name was stupid. When they brought him over, Yeah, like, I'd much rather to have him be called Paul White than the Big Show. I thought the name was stupid. He made a hell of a debut, though, in WWF. 
But the giant who wins literally the world title in his first like match or second match, ridiculous. Yeah. Like, he was super green, but he was learning. And again, another guy that's main event or bust. Like, what do you do with him? He ain't gonna be on opening matches with Flying Brian. That's for sure. Yep. But, or bust. I mean, but there's not much to say about this match. I mean, it has. No, I mean, you have the you have the Kevin Sullivan Benoit stuff going on here, which is uncomfortable to talk about from time to time. Yeah. Um, I think uh, uh, I Respect You, Booker Man, was the pay-per-view before this. So we'll talk about that when we get to it. it, what's, it what's, I mean... And then, two, I think the pay-per-view before this was the Balls Count Underwear match with uh, Sullivan and Benoit. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in your opinion, I mean, cause, you know, with the whole Chris Benoit situation and what, and, you know, what happened with him and his wife and his kid and he killed them all and then killed himself. I mean, it's just... It, it's sometimes hard to watch his matches knowing the outcome of his life, knowing that he had such great talent, such great potential. And, you know, I mean, you can't, I mean, you can cheer for it, but then you're like, eh. here's the thing when it comes to Benoit, I don't know if I spoke about this on, on this particular show, but I might as well talk about it right now. From like, I guess, 1999, 98 until up until his death. Chris Benoit was my favorite wrestler. My number one guy. I was in Madison Square Garden ringside when he wins the WWF Championship or World Heavyweight Championship. And what you don't see on that show, WrestleMania 20, is the post-match celebration with Daniel and Nancy running out to the ring and celebrating with Chris in the ring. And I'm saying we're inside for this. And I'm watching this, right? And Chris Benoit was my guy, 100%. My favorite wrestler. I used to watch his DVD, Hard Knocks, the Chris Benoit story all the time. My favorite wrestler. So when this goes down, when this tragedy happened, when this, it really just ripped me apart. It tore me up inside very bad because I'm literally watching this in real time. Like this is when this, you know, this is when the the wrestling websites are we're getting live reports. Literally, I'm having Wikipedia being changed in real time in front of my face. And then you, they do the Benoit tribute show, and then all the rest of the information comes out like right after the show. At that point, was the last point or the last era where I watched professional wrestling regularly, like every week. I watch just about every Monday Night Raw, with a couple exceptions, weekly, every single week since 1993. I've watched every Nitro up in its tilt its demise, but I watched every Raw just about. A couple exceptions here and there, especially when it gets to 1994 WWF. But regularly watch wrestling every week up until that point. After that, I stopped watching wrestling regularly on television. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, it's one of those things. I mean, do you think, you know, they like you said, they had this the tragedy, then they had the uh, the tribute show on um, on Raw. Do you think they would have, if they'd known the information, do you think they would have just? I mean, you can't really gloss over his death. I mean, of him passing and doing a tribute. But do you think they would have done anything, or do you think they would have just kind of gone on it with the uh, with a the show? Up. They did a tribute. They did a tribute show. They should have not. They should have had. They should have ran it like a repeat or something like. Yeah. They should have done anything. Like that. Yep. We come up with a statement in the very next Raw. You know, Vince makes a statement and then you move on. But here's the thing too. I think a lot of people forget about that weekend. Like Sherry had just died too. Sensational Sherry had just passed away, and they just did Vince McMahon's death that same week. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where he got blown up in, in the limo. And not for nothing, WWF at the time were like it was really bad. It was like people bitch about it now. At the time, there was nothing worse than WWE during that time. Like it was like you had Vince McMahon and Shane McMahon taking on Shawn Michaels and God. Like it was really, really bad. It was really fucking bad around that era. And it's just I couldn't watch it anymore. It was it, it was over. You but know, I, I tried to catch because my second favorite wrestler at the time was CM Punk, and he was starting to raise, or kind of rise to the ranks here. So we were checking on what Punk was doing, but in terms of watching entire shows 
regularly week after week, that stops at that point. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know. It's never been the same. It's never been the same. It makes watching Benoit matches extremely difficult. Now, a lot of people will fucking make jokes or don't, don't take it serious. But there was, you know, there's a lot of wrestling fans that, you know, we're 2019 at this point that came after you know, Benoit. You started watching wrestling regularly after Benoit. You know, it's, it's, it's something that my fandom was changed forever at that point. And it's never been the same. You know, I'm kind of I'm glad that you got back into the uh, the sport, so we can talk about it each week and kind of reminisce about uh, you know wrestling from 1976 to 2000 when it kind of shit can't. So you should thank Ring of Honor for that. Thank you, ROH. Not Ring of Honor of 2019. I'm talking about Ring of Honor of like 2010. Yeah. Now to the main event: six man tag match, The Outsiders. And a mystery partner. And a mystery partner. Who would that be versus Randy Savage, Sting, and Lex Luger? Let me ask you a question. Yes. Who do you think it was going to be? <sighs> like, did you have any? Like, did you just not have a guess? I did not have a guess. To really? Be, you just, like, to, to, be, to be honest with you, I think. I mean, I, I'm kind of like you. I, no I thought it was Hogan. I'm sorry. No one thought it was Hogan. It was so far. It was so out of left field. I, actually, I, I knew it was Hogan, but that's. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, okay, no. I, I'm. This is this is a shoot, brother. Um, it was. David Banner told you. No. This was at, Oh, actually, no. This is uh, crap. No, this is actually the year before I uh, actually worked for WCW. So uh, this would not be. Uh, if I if I had been there in 1996, I was there in '97. I could have had some insider information, but why didn't even know? No, nope, they did not. Hogan didn't know until like there's stories of Kevin Sullivan having to sleep on Hulk Hogan's couch to make sure he doesn't fucking change his mind about doing this. Because he was 50-50 on this. Again, you know, a lot of people were like, especially Hogan's agents and whatever, were like, no, this is gonna kill you. Like, you're not gonna get, you know, your your licensing, your merch money. Like, that's just holding on the toilet. Like you're you're going to kill yourself. And a lot of people were pulling Hogan in the other direction. Of like not yeah. Doing that. I mean, and, and, and it, okay, we're just saying, what if, what if Hulk Hogan did not come to WCW and do this? I mean, do you think it would have changed, if, it would have changed the course of WCW? Yes, yes. Yes. And yes. Thank you, Danny there, Bryan. There's two things. WCW would have went out of business a lot faster. And WWF would have also went out of business. Really? Yeah. Here's the reason why. Hulk Hogan does not go to WCW. That means he stays in WWF. That means Vince was addicted to the Hulkster. That means anytime he got jammed up, he would go back to Hulk. So, oh, Bret Hart's not drawing great. Hogan's going to beat him. Oh, Kevin Nash is not drawing great. Hogan's going to beat him. Oh, we're not sure about the Steve Austin guy. Hogan's going to beat him. You know what I mean? He would have just kept on going back to Hogan. It would have fucking killed the WWF. The, they, they had to get Hogan out of there. They needed to get Hogan out of there. Or they were never going to survive because Vince would have would have kept would have kept on going back to Hogan, and I can only imagine the politics that would have went on between Hogan and Shawn Michaels in like 1996. It would have been fucking a fucking train wreck. I mean, it would have definitely been definitely been weird. I mean, it's I mean now for me, who did I think it was going to be? I thought it was going to be Bret Hart. Really? Yeah, because the way it was always framed that it was a WWF guy coming over. So it could have been, I was like, it could have been anyone that was, you know, a lot of people thought it was Shawn Michaels. But again, this is 1996. I'm not reading The Observer. I'm I'm reading PWI. So it, I don't know how wrestling contracts work or any of that shit. So to me, like, it could be just about anyone. And to me, it's like, oh, they're going to bring in Kevin Nash, Scott Hall. Who's the next logical step? Bret Hart or Shawn Michaels? 100%. They didn't see Hogan coming. Now, what also the possible was Lex Luger turning in the match and because he just came from WWF. So it could have been Hogan turning on Savage and Sting. I didn't think it was going to be Savage. Some people thought it might have been Sting, but I didn't think so. No one. I'm talking about fans. I'm not talking about insiders. I'm not talking about I'm talking about fans. Like no one because Hogan's been gone. Hogan was gone for a while. We haven't seen him in a minute. So no Hogan was on anyone's radar. They come down and do the turn. And heck, when he came out, I didn't think he was going to turn anyway. I thought he was going to come out and make the save and, and beat up the Outsiders. 1,000%. Heck, even after he dropped the leg on Savage, I'm like, oh, shit, 
Savage was the third man, and Hogan dropped the lick on him because Hogan found out about the conspiracy and stopped it before it got started. Boy, he yeah. the outside. I'm like, holy shit. My brain fucking exploded. Boy, you were just a... Uh, you were a... Uh, a I was yeah. a homaniac, 1,000%. So I never thought he was going to turn heel. God, you drank that fucking Hulk Hogan juice. Holy shit. I drank those fucking vitamins. Lock, stock, and fucking barrel. God, you were, I mean, hook, line, and fucking sinker, buddy. I mean. They made the greatest angle. They got so much fucking heat. You see the garbage get piled in the ring. A fan fucking jumps in the ring and gets fucking beaten up. Because fuck it, right? Might as well. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, now that we've. Uh, no, no. Phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, it was phenomenal. I mean, it, there was a lot of shit in that ring. I mean, it was, it was phenomenal. I mean, it was like that, Hogan cuts out like a, this promo that's really, really good. Me and Gene on top of his game, and then basically you have Scott Hall and then Kevin Nash mugging at the camera, which is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of. I mean, now that we've you know kind of looked at it, I mean, it, I I give this show probably, I gave it about an eight out of ten. Yeah, it's it's pretty. I mean, again. I love it because it's so WCW. And if people want to say, who knows? What's WCW? What is WCW like? Because, you know, I talk to a lot of people, you know, especially at my workplace and stuff, they started watching wrestling in like 2004. You know what I mean? Because it's 2019 now, guys. So when we look at something from 96, it's like, oh, show, show me a show that's that's WCW through and through. I'm like, Bash the Beast, 1996. Yeah, I mean it was it was definitely I mean it was it was a great pay per view I mean and, and you know the the next like I said the next pay per view we're going to be covering is uh, Royal Rumble nineteen ninety four I, I mean I cannot wait to cover that next week but it, it's funny people have been asking me on Twitter they they say David Fine we we've been following you on Twitter we see you on Facebook um, you have some brand new posters that you know that kind of that, that kind of talk about. They kind of talk about the uh, the podcast and, and and you know tell tell everybody you know it's going to drop every Wednesday. We also got some new business cards. They ask who in the hell did that? You know it, it's kind of funny that you asked me that. Uh, it's called Wrestle Rebrand. They're out of out of the United Kingdom. Uh, Steve over there at Wrestle Rebrand. Uh, if you want to follow them on Twitter, it's at Wrestle Rebrand. I mean they do. Uh, logos, banners, channel art, posters, T-shirts, and much more. I mean. They're going to get our Twitter numbers up. It's They're going to help us on our YouTube page. It's, I mean, they're a great company. Just follow them on Twitter. You can get a, a free banner, a free logo. They're giving that away before, um, as they say in the United Kingdom, the 31st of December. It's December 31st. Uh, just retweet them. Uh, just follow them at Wrestle Rebrand. And you could maybe uh, maybe win a free uh, banner and a logo before uh, 2020 starts. I mean, hey, I mean, you, you don't need a new logo or new uh, banner, do you? No, but I do need a. Uh, I want to get my wife for Christmas this year a uh, calendar. New, hu- of my new husband. The buff. So a new calendar of myself would be exceptional. So if anyone wants to uh, draw pictures of me naked, so I can give it to my wife for for Christmas, uh, reach out to me on Twitter. Oh yes, I mean, and on that odd note, for the great Alex G, as always, I am David Fine. I cannot wait to see everyone back next week for another exciting edition of the Retro Wrestling Rewind. As always, we'll talk to you in the past. Andre the Giant. the greatest WWE champion of all time, and in many ways, the man who made the title what it is today, Bruno Sammartino. His opponent, weighing 236 pounds in the white corner, from Van Nuys,